Stranger in the Village by James Baldwin From all available evidence, no black man had ever set foot in this tiny Swiss village before I came. I was told before arriving that I would probably be a sight for the village. I took this to mean that people of my complexion were rarely seen in Switzerland, and also that city people are always something of a sight outside of the city. It did not occur to me, possibly, because I am an American, that there could be people anywhere who had never seen a Negro. It is a fact that cannot be explained on the basis of an inaccessibility of the village. The village is very high, but it is only four hours from Milan and three hours from Alsun. It is true that it is virtually unknown. Few people making plans for a holiday would elect to come here. On the other hand, the villagers are able, presumably, to come and go as they please, which they do to another town at the foot of the mountain with a population of approximately 5,000, the nearest place to see a movie or go to the bank. In the village there is no movie house, no bank, no library, no theatre, very few radios, one jeep, one station wagon, and at the moment one typewriter, mine, an invention which the woman next door to me here had never seen. There are about 600 people living here, all Catholic, I conclude this from the fact that the Catholic church is open all year round, whereas the Protestant chapel, set off on the hill a little removed from the village, is open only in the summertime when the tourists arrive. There are four or five hotels, all closed now, and four or five bistros, of which, however, only two do any business during the winter. These two do not do a great deal, for life in the village seems to end around nine or ten o'clock. There are few stores, butcher, baker, a pissery, a hardware store, and a money changer who cannot change travellers' checks, but must send them down to the bank, an operation which takes two or three days. There is something called the ballet horse, closed in the winter and used for God knows what, certainly not ballet, during the summer. There seems to be one, only one schoolhouse in the village, and this for the quite young children, I suppose this to mean that their older brothers and sisters at some point descend from these mountains in order to complete their education, possibly, again, to the town just below. The landscape is absolutely forbidding, mountains towering on all four sides, ice and snow as far as the eye can reach. In this white wilderness, men and women and children move all day, carrying washing wood, buckets of milk or milk water, sometimes skiing on Sunday afternoons, All week long, boys and young men are to be seen shoveling snow off the rooftops or dragging wood down from the forest in the sleds. The village's only real attraction, which explains the tourist season, is the hot spring water. A disquietingly high proportion of these tourists are cripples, or semi-cripples, who come year after year from other parts of Switzerland, usually to take the waters. This lends the village, at the height of the season, a rather terrifying air of scancency, as though it were a lesser lord's. There is often something beautiful, there is always something awful, in the spectacle of a person who has lost one of his faculties, a faculty he can never question until it was gone, and who struggles to recover it. Yet people remain people on crutches or indeed on deathbeds, and wherever I passed the first summer I was here, among the native villagers or among the lame, a wind passed with me in astonishment, curiosity, amusement and outrage. That first summer I stayed two weeks and never intended to return. But I did return in the winter to work. The village offers, obviously, no distractions whatever and has the further advantage of being extremely cheap. Now it is winter again, a year later and I'm here again. Everyone in the village knows my name, though they scarcely ever use it, knows that I come from America though this apparently they will never really believe. Black men come from Africa, and everyone knows that I am a friend of the son of a woman who was born here, and that I am staying in their chalet. But I remain as much a stranger today as I was the first day I arrived, and the children shout, Niga, Niga, as I walk along the streets. It must be admitted that in the beginning I was far too shocked to have any real reaction, in so far as I reacted at all. I reacted by trying to be pleasant, it being a great part of the American Negro education, long before he goes to school, that he must make people like him. This smile and the world smiles with you routine worked about as well in this situation 
as it had in the situation for which it was designed, which is two of the phenomenon which allowed them to see my teeth they did not really see my smile, and they began to think that should I take to smiling, no one would notice any difference. All of the physical characteristics of a negro which had caused me in America a very different and almost forgotten pain were nothing less than miraculous or infernal in the eyes of the village people. Some thought my hair was the colour of tar, that he had the texture of wire or the texture of cotton. It was jocularly suggested that I might let it all grow along and make myself a winter coat. If I sat in the sun for more than five minutes, some daring creature was certain to come along and gingerly put his fingers on my hair, as though he were afraid of an electric shock, or put his hand on my hand, astonished that the colour did not rub off. In all of this, in which it must be conceded, there was a charm of genuine wonder, and in which there was certainly no element of intentional unkindness. There was yet no suggestion that I was human, I was simply a living wonder. I knew that they did not mean to be unkind, and I know it now. It is necessary, nevertheless, for me to repeat this to myself each time that I walk out of the chalet. The children who shout Niga have no way of knowing that echoes this sound raises in me. They are brim with good humour, and they more daring swell with pride when I stop to speak with them. Just the same, there are days when I cannot pause and smile, when I have no heart to play with them, when indeed I mutter solely to myself, exactly as I muttered on the streets of the city these children have never seen, when I was no bigger than these children are now. Your mother was a nigger. Joyce is right about history being a nightmare, but it may be a nightmare from which no one can awaken. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. There's a custom in the village, I am told it is repeated in many villages, of buying African natives for the purpose of converting them to Christianity. There stands in the church all year round a small box with a slot of money, decorated with a black figurine, and into this box the villagers drop their friends. During the carnival which precedes Lent, two village children have their faces blackened out of the bloodless darkness, their blue eyes shine like ice and a fantastic horsehair wigs are placed on their blonde heads. Thus disguised, they solicit among the villagers for money for the missionaries in Africa. Between the box in the church and the blackened children, the IJ village bought last year six or eight African natives. This was reported to me with pride by the wife of one of the bistro owners, and I was careful to express astonishment and pleasure at the solitude shown by the village for the souls of the black folks. The bistro owner's wife beamed with a pleasure far more genuine than my own, and seemed to feel that I might now breathe more easily concerning the souls of at least six of my kinsmen. I tried not to think of these so lately baptised kinsmen, or the price paid for them, or the peculiar price they themselves would pay, and say nothing about my father, who having taken his own conversation too literally, never at bottom forgave the white world, which he described as heathen, for having saddled him with a Christ in whom, to judge at least from their treatment of him, they themselves no longer believed. I thought of white men arriving for the first time in an African village, strangers there as I am a stranger here, and try to imagine the astounded populace touching their hair and marvelling at the colour of their skin. But there is a great difference between being the first white man to be seen by Africans and being the first black man to be seen by whites. The white man takes the astonishment as tribute, for he arrives to conquer and to convert the natives, whose inferiority in relation to himself is not even to be questioned, whereas I, without a thought of conquest, find myself among the people whose culture controls me, has even in a sense created me, people who have cost me more in anguish and rage than they will ever know, who yet do not even know of my existence. The astonishment with which I might have greeted them should have stumbled into my African village a few hundred years ago might have rejoiced their hearts, but the astonishment with which they greet me today can only poison mine. And this is so despite everything I may do to feel differently, despite my friendly conversations with the bistro owner's wife, despite the three-year-old son who has at last become my friend, despite the salut and bonsoir, which I exchange with people as I walk, despite the fact that I know that no individual can be taken to task for what history is doing or has done. I say that the culture of these people controls me, but they can scarcely be held responsible for European culture. America comes out of Europe. But these people have never seen America. 
nor have most of them seen more of the Europe than the hamlet at the foot of their mountain. Yet they move with an authority which I shall never have, and they regard me quite rightly not only as a stranger in the village, but a suspect latecomer, bearing no credentials, to everything they have, however, unconsciously inherited. For this village, even were it incomparable, more remote and incredibly more primitive, is the West, the West unto which I have been so strangely grafted. These people cannot be, from the point of view of power, strangers anywhere in the world. They have made the modern world, in effect, even if they do know it. The most illiterate among them is related in any way that I am not to Dante, Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Aeschylus, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Racine, the cathedral at Cartres, say something to them which it cannot say to me, as indeed would New York's Empire State Building, should anyone here ever see it. Out of their hymns and dances come Beethoven and Bach. Go back to a few centuries and they are in the full glory, but I am in Africa, watching the conquerors arrive. The rage of the disesteemed is personally fruitless, but it is also absolutely inevitable. The rage, so generally discounted, so little understood, even among the people whose daily bread it is, is one of the things that makes history. Rage can only with difficulty, and never entirely, be brought under the domination of the intelligence, and is therefore not susceptible to any arguments whatever. This is a fact which ordinary representatives of Heron and Revolk, having never felt this rage and being unable to imagine quite fail to understand, also, rage cannot be hidden. It can only be dissembled. This dissembling deludes the thoughtless and strengthens rage and adds to rage and contempt. There are no doubt as many ways of copying with the resulting complex of tension as there are black men in the world, but no black man can hope ever to be entirely liberated from this internal warfare rage, disassembling and contempt having inevitably accompanied his first realisation of the power of white men. What is crucial here is that since white men represent in the black man's world so heavy a weight, white men have for black men a reality which is far from being reciprocal, and hence all black men have toward all white men an attitude which is designed, really, either to rob the white man of the jewel of his naivete, or else to make it cost him dear. The black man insists, by whatever means he finds at his disposal, the white man ceases to regard him as an exotic rarity and recognise him as a human being. This is a very charged and difficult moment, for there is a great deal of willpower involved in the white man's naivety. Most people are not naturally reflective any more than they are naturally malicious, and the white man prefers to keep the black man at a certain human remove, because it is easier for him thus to preserve his simplicity and avoid being called to account for crimes committed by his forefathers or his neighbours. He is inescapably aware, nevertheless, that he is in a better position in the world than black men are, nor can he quite put to death the suspicion that he is hated by black men, therefore. He does not wish to be hated, neither does he wish to change places, and at this point in his uneasiness he can scarcely avoid having recourse to those legends which white men have created about black men, the most usual effect of which is that the white man finds himself in enmeshed, so to speak, in his own language, which describes hell, as well as the attribute which lead one to hell, as being as black as night. Every legend, moreover, contains its residuum of truth, and the root function of language is to control the universe by describing it. It is of quite considerable significance that black men remain in the imagination, and in overwhelming numbers, in fact, beyond the dis discipline of salvation, and this despite the fact that the West has been buying African natives for centuries. There is, I should hazard, an instantaneous necessity to be divorced from this so visibly unsaved stranger, in whose heart, moreover, one cannot guess what dreams of vengeance are being nourished, and at the same time there are few things on earth more attractive than the idea of the unspeakable liberty which is allowed the unredeemed when beneath the black mask a human being begins to make himself felt, one cannot escape a certain awful wonder as to what kind of human being it is. What one's imagination makes of other people is dictated, of course, by the master race laws of one's own personality, and it's one of the ironies of black-white relations that, 
by means of what the white man imagines the black man to be, the black man is unable to know who the white man is. I have ever said, for example, that I am as much a stranger in this village today as I was the first summer I arrived, but this is not quite true. The villagers wonder less about the texture of my hair than they did then, and wonder rather more about me, and the fact that their wonder now exists on another level is reflected in their attitudes and in their eyes. There are the children who make those delightful, hilarious, sometimes astonishingly grave overtures of friendship in the unpredictable fashion of children. Other children, having been taught that the devil is a black man, scream in genuine anguish as I approach. Some of the older women never pass without a friendly greeting, never pass indeed, if it seems that they will be able to engage me in conversation. Other women look down or look away, or rather contemptuously smirk. Some of the men drink with me and suggest that I learn how to ski partially. I gather because they cannot imagine that I would li look like a skis, and want to know if I am married and ask questions about my mitia. But some of the men have accused Le Sala Negre behind my back of stealing wood, and there is already in the eyes of some of them that peculiar intent, paranoid m malevolence, which one sometimes surprises in the eyes of the American white men when, out walking with their Sunday girl, they see a Negro male approach. There is a dreadful abyss between the streets of this village and the streets of the city in which I was born, between the children who shout nigger today and those who shouted nigger yesterday, the abyss is experience, the American experience. The syllable held behind me today expresses above all wonder. I am a stranger here, but I am not a stranger in America, and the same syllable riding on the American air expresses the war my presence has occasioned an American soul. For well, this village brings home to me this fact, that there was a day, and not really a very distant day, when Americans were scarcely Americans at all, but discontented Europeans, facing a great unconquered continent and strolling, say, into a marketplace and being black for the first time. The shock this spectacle afforded is suggested surely by the promptness with which they decided that these black men were not really men but cattle. It is true that the necessity on the part of the settlers of the new world of reconsidering their moral assumptions with the fact and the necessity of slavery enhanced immensely the charm of this idea. And it is also true that this idea expresses with a truly American bluntness the attitude which is varying extent all masters have had towards all slaves. Between all former slaves and slave owners and the drama which begins for Americans over 300 years ago at Jamestown, there are at least two differences to be observed. The American Negro slave could not suppose for one thing as slaves in past epoch had supposed and often done that he would ever be able to wrest the power for his master's hand. This was a superstition which the modern era, which was to bring about of such vast changes in the aims and dimensions of power, put to death. It only begins in unprecedented fashion and with the dreadful implications to be resurrected today. But even had this superstition persisted with undiminished force, the American Negro slave could not have used it to lend his conditioned dignity for the reason that this J superstition rests on another, that the slave in exile yet remains related to his past, as some means, if only in memory of revering and sustaining the forms of his former life, is able, in short, to maintain his identity. This was not the case with the American Negro slave. He is unique among the black men of the world in that his past was taken from him, almost literally, at one blow. One wonders what on earth the first slave found to say to the first dark child he bore. I am told that there are Haitians able to trace their ancestry back to African kings, but any American Negro wishing to go back so far will find his journey through time abruptly arrested by the signature on the bill of sale which served as the entrance paper for his ancestor. At the time to say nothing of the circumstances of enslavement of the captive black man who was to become the American Negro, there was not the remotest possibility that he would ever take power from his master's hands. There was no reason to suppose that his situation would ever change, nor was there shortly anything to indicate that his situation had ever been different. It was his necessity in the world of E 
Franklin Fraser to find a motive for living under American culture would die. The identity of the American Negro comes out of this extreme situation, and the evolution of this identity was the source of the most intolerable anxiety in the minds and lives of his masters. For the history of the American Negro is unique, also in this, the question of his humanity and his rights therefore as a human being became a burning one of several generations of Americans, so burning a question that it ultimately became one of those used to divide the nation. It is out of this argument that the venom of epitaph, nigger, is derived. It is an argument which Europe has never had, and hence Europe quite sincerely fails to understand how or why the argument arose in the first place, why its effects are frequently disastrous and always so unpredictable, why it refuses until today to be entirely settled. Europe's black possessions remained and do remain in Europe's colonies, as which removed they represented no threat whatever to European identity. If they posed any problem at all for the European conscience, it was a problem which remained confrontingly abstract. In effect, the black man as a man did not exist for Europe, but in America, even as a slave, he was an inescapable part of the general social fabric, and no American could escape having an attitude towards him. Americans attempt until today to make an abstraction of Negro, but the very nature of these abstractions reveal the tremendous effects the presence of Negro has had on American character. When one considers the history of the Negro in America, it is of the greatest importance to reorganize, recognize that the moral beliefs of a person or people are never really as tenuous as life, which is not moral very, often causes them to appear. These create for them a frame of reference and a necessary hope, the hope being that when life has done its worst, they will be enabled to rise among themselves and to triumph over life. Life would scarcely be bearable if this hope did not exist. Again, even when the worst has been said, to betray a belief is not by any means to have put oneself beyond its power. The betrayal of a belief is not the same thing as ceasing to believe. If this were not so, there would be no moral standards in the world at all. Yet one must also recognise that morality is biased on ideas, and that all ideas are dangerous, dangerous because ideas can only lead to action, and where the action leads, no man can say. And dangerous in this respect that confronted with the impossibility of remaining faithful to one's beliefs, and the equal impossibility of becoming free of them, one can be driven to the most inhumane excesses. The ideas on which American beliefs are based are not, though Americans often seem to think so, ideas which originated in America. They came out of Europe. And the establishment of democracy on the American continent was scarcely as radical a break with the past as was the necessity which Americans faced of broadening this concept to include black men. This was literally a hard necessity. It was impossible for one thing, for Americans to abandon their beliefs, not only because these beliefs alone seemed able to justify the sacrifices they had endured and the blood that they had spilled, but also because these beliefs afforded them their only bulwark against the moral chaos as absolute as the physical chaos of the continent it was their destiny to conquer. But in the situation in which Americans found themselves, these beliefs threatened an idea which, whether or not one likes to think so, is the very warp and woof of the heritage of the West, the idea of white supremacy. Americans have made themselves notorious by the shrewdness and the brutality with which they have insisted on this idea, but they did not invent it, and it has escaped the world's notice that those very excesses of which Americans have been guilty imply a certain unprecedented uneasiness over the ideas of life and power, if not indeed the idea's validity. The idea of white supremacy rests simply on the fact that white men are the creators of civilization, the present civilization, which is the only one that matters. All previous civilizations are simply contributions to our own and therefore civilization's guardians and defenders. Thus, it was impossible for Americans to accept the black man as one of themselves, for to do so was to jeopardise their status as white men. 
but not so to accept him as to deny his human reality, his human weight and complexity, and the strain of denying the overwhelmingly undeniable forced Americans into rationalizations so fantastic that they approached the pathological. At the root of the American Negro problem is the necessity of the American white man to find a way of living with a Negro in order to be able to live with himself. And the history of this problem can be reduced to the means used by Americans' lynch law. A law of segregation and legal acceptance, terrorization and the consention either to come to terms with this necessity or to find a way around it almost unusually, to find a way of doing both these things at once. The resulting spectacle, at once foolish and dreadful, led someone to make the quite accurate observation that the Negro in America is a form of insanity which overtakes white men. In this long battle, a battle by no means finished, the unforeseeable effects of which will be felt by many future generations, the white man's motive was the protection of his identity. The black man was motivated by the need to establish an identity. And despite the terrorization which the Negro in America endured and endures sporadically until today, despite the cruel and totally inescapable ambivalence of his status in his country, the battle for his identity has long ago been won. He is not a visitor to the West, but a citizen there, an American. As American as the Americans who despise him, the Americans who fear him, the Americans who love him, the Americans who become less than themselves or rose to be greater than themselves by virtue of the fact that the challenge he represented was inescapable. He is perhaps the only black man in the world whose relationship to white men is more terrible, more subtle and more meaningful than the relationship of bitter possessed to uncertain possessors. His survival depended and his development depends on his ability to turn his peculiar status in the Western world to his own advantage, and it may be to the very great advantage of that world. It remains for him to fashion out of his experience that which will give him sustenance and a voice. The cathedral at Tartarus, I have said, says something to the people of this village which it cannot say to me, but it is important to understand that this cathedral says something to me which it cannot say to them. Perhaps they are struck by the power of the spires, the glory of the windows, but they have known God, after all, longer than I have known him, and in a different way. And I'm terrified by the slippery bottomless well to be found in the crypt down which her heretics were hurled to death, and by the obscene inescapable gargoyles jutting out of the stone and the seeming to say that God and the devil can never be divorced. I doubt that the villagers think of the devil when they face a cathedral because they have never been identified with the devil. But I must accept the status which myth, if nothing else, gives me in the West before I can hope to change this myth. Yet if the American Negro has arrived at this identity by virtue of absoluteness of his estrangement from his past, American white men still nourish the illusion that there is some means of recovering the European innocence a return to a state in which black men do not exist. This is one of the greatest errors of Americans can make. The identity they fought so hard to protect has, by virtue of that battle, undergone a change. Americans are as unlike any other white people in the world as it is possible to be. I do not think, for example, that it is too much to suggest that the American vision of the world, which allows so little reality, generally speaking for any of the darker forces in human life, which tends until today to paint moral issues in glaring black and white oaths, a great deal to the battle waged by Americans to maintain between themselves a black man, a human separation which could not be bridged. It is only now beginning to be born in us, very faintly, it must be admitted very slowly, and bridged. and very much against our will that this vision of the world is dangerously inaccurate and perfectly useless, for it protects our moral high-mindedness at the terrible expense of weakening our grasp of reality. People who shut their eyes to reality simply invite their own destruction. 
and anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after their innocence is dead turns himself into a monster. The time has come to realise that interracial drama acted out on the American continent has not only created a new black man, it has created a new white man too. No road whatever will lead Americans back to the simplicity of this European village where white men still have the luxury of looking on me as a stranger. I am not, really, a stranger any longer for any American alive. One of the things that distinguishes Americans from other people is that no other people has ever been so deeply involved in the lives of black men and vice versa. This fact faced with all its implications, it can be seen that the history of the American Negro problem is not merely shameful, it is also something of an achievement. For even when the worst has been saved, it must also be added that the perceptual challenge posed by this problem was always somehow perpetually met. It is precisely this black-white experience which may prove of indispensable value to us in the world we face today. This world is white no longer, and it will never be white again.